Hello, everyone, to today's GOCC. It's my pleasure today that we have an expository talk today by Monica Vazirani from UC Davis. But before I hand the stage over to, to her, let me remind all of us of our community statement with the three guiding principles. We are all learning. Everyone has something to, to continue contribute and no one has all the answers and i think this is something we especially should keep in mind with expository talks where an expert is talking so try to ask as many questions as you want but keep in mind it's it can also happen that not even the speaker knows the answer with that said it's my pleasure to hand over the stage to monica vasirani from uc davis please take it away Okay, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me and for organizing this. I didn't really know that this uh, series of, of colloquia was going on. I think it's really wonderful. Um, okay, so my research is in combinatorial representation theory. And so uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to focus a lot. Sorry, my slides kind of change size somehow because I'm not great with the technology. Um, so the combinatorics part is all going to be the combinatorics of this picture, just Young's lattice of partitions. And, uh, and then what is representation theory or how this picture appears in representation theory kind of many times over and in more places that I'm going to have time to talk about today. In fact, this, this picture pops up so many ways. So first, just in case, um, I run out of time or I go out there. Let's just start playing with the combinatorics of this. And then, you know, you can doodle off to the side and play with this, even if you tune out of, um, of everything else. So, okay, Young's Lives of Partitions. Let's see. So what is a partition? We'll come back to this picture in a little bit. So what is a partition? Uh, there are set partitions and there are integer partitions. I'm talking about integer partitions today. And so you could say, well, what is a partition of three? It's a way of writing three as a sum of other positive numbers, like one plus one plus one. And because it's one plus one plus one, I like to draw it as I have, you know, one box and one box and one box in each row. And then I, I left justify and I do English notation. So I upper justify, some people will lower justify. And some people will put this on a diagonal. You'll see many conventions for drawing this. Okay, so there's other ways of summing up num positive numbers and getting three. And I invite people at any time to like call out, but I know on Zoom, there's like less, um, it's, I don't know, it feels uh, less now. Three is a great way of adding up to three. Three, exactly. We can do three. And then the way that I would draw that is I would say, okay, it's just three. So I would only have one row because I have one number, but that row would have three boxes. Is there any other way we can do this? Two plus one. We can do two plus one. And two plus one, because addition is commutative is the same as one plus two. So my convention will be to put all the bigger numbers first. And so that means that first I'll draw a two box row, then I'll draw a one box row, and I'll have this partition that, you know, I'll call it the partition two one, just like I'll call this the partition three, and I'll call this the partition one one one. I'm often lazy about my commas. Also, sometimes people get really tired of writing the repetition. So they might write that as one cubed, one, one, one. Okay, and again, I'm always left justifying everything as opposed to having you know two boxes here and then the one box floating out in space. Um, and again, I like to upper justify it so that my bigger numbers are on top and my smaller numbers are on the bottom. Okay, and so in um, Young's lattice of partitions, we go back, if we look at the third level, okay, if we look at the third level, well, here they all are in different order than what we discovered on the last page. Okay, so for instance, if I said, what are all the integer partitions of four? You would read it here, one plus one plus one, 
three plus one, two plus two, two plus one plus one, and here's my one plus one plus one plus one. Okay, and you can check that there's really only five ways to do it. Okay. So this is Young's lattice of partitions, and then here's all the partitions of five and so on. And some questions you can ask yourself as well. What's the pattern that there's you know one partition here of zero, we do empty to one partition, two partitions, three partitions, the next comes five, then comes seven, then comes 11. What's the pattern? Um, is there a formula for it? Can you guess? Also, um, I've drawn some edges here. And let's see if I, whoops. Sorry about that. Yeah, so what are the edges meaning? So the edges mean a lot of things, but combinatorially, how am I drawing an edge? Well, uh, if I think about the partitions of two versus the partitions of three, so the partitions of two, we have two and one plus one, one. And then we have the partitions of three here. So when do I decide to draw an edge between them? Given my justification rules, what every one of these has in common is they're kind of pushed up into the corner. And so if I identify the corners and I draw the two diagrams simultaneously from the second level to the third, I want the second level to fit completely inside. So, right, if I line up these guys, the second one fits completely inside, whereas if I try to overlay it here, it doesn't fit inside. And so if we go down and we look, you know, aha, if you, now if you look, right, there is an edge from here to here, but there is not an edge from two to one plus one plus one. And on the picture, that's you know very easy to see how to draw the edges, what it means in terms of the integer partitions on that list, and what's going on there. You can sort of think about that on your own of how that's reflected. It's really nice to have the pictures. Okay. And so now uh, you know you can give this to your favorite elementary school student, and they can go off and they can keep drawing this and having a lot of fun, and they can make all kinds of observations and questions and do all kinds of things with this. And so where we're going with this is, well, how does it enter representation theory? And the first place it's going to enter representation theory for me will be of the symmetric group. So now let's talk about the symmetric group. Okay, so the symmetric group of an S sub n. So what is it? Uh, so it's S sub n. It's the permutations of 1, 2, 3, 4, da, 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 up to n. Right. So you can think of the permutations as a list, you know, you permute. So you can say like one, two, three, three, one, two, three, two, one, and so on. Or um, if you've had some group theory, it's a group, you can think of it as a group of bijections. So it's actually not just that you have three, two, one, it's a map that would permute, that would actually send one to three, two to two, and three to one. And so as that group, as a set of bijections, we can say it acts you learned about group actions, it acts on the set one, two, three, up through n. Okay, so for instance, you know, S2 acts on the set one, two, the identity keeps them fixed, and then the swap swaps one and two. All right, um, so those, that's, you know, groups and group actions, and my, you know, my favorite group in the world is a symmetric group, um, and which can be generalized in many different interesting directions, depending on how much time we get to today. So, one thing that's actually very useful, instead of just talking about groups and sets, is to linearize, is to jump into vector spaces. And uh, why, why might you do that? It actually, um, so it's kind of in modern mathematics, we often like to up our category level. So, you know, a set is great, but a vector space, uh, encompasses sets, but you can do more with them. So for instance, this set one, two, I could realize it, whoops, as well, C2 is the span of E1 and E2. And this E1 and E2 are kind of like my set one and two. And in fact, that's how I can think about linearizing. I can just say, 
hey, call this guy a basis vector, call that guy a basis vector, and see what happens. Uh, and then uh, if you've heard of like one categories and two categories and so on, there's actually uh, benefit to if you can keep upping your category level to do some interesting math. Um, one thing uh, that's nice is that, you know, if you're looking at sets, you just have bijections between sets. If you're looking at vector spaces, wow, you have linear maps between vector spaces. Even if they're isomorphisms, you have so many more. Right, you've got you know invertible matrices. There's just a lot richer structure going on with the as you say the morphisms. So that's one sort of takeaway um, in math is that if you have some really nice situation, make it more complicated for yourself. Make it richer, and you'll see what pops out. So let's see what's popping out here. Okay, so linear algebra review. Right, if one and two swap, if the transposition one two swaps one and two, we know what it does on the set. What does it do on this basis? Well, if you're describing a linear map, you're saying, what does it do to the basis? You get a matrix. So one, two goes to this permutation matrix whose columns are zero, one, and one, zero. Okay. So we just started to do representation theory because we took a group element and we said, we replaced it with a matrix. We said it should act by this matrix and now it's acting on a vector space. And so when a group acts on a vector space, we tend to call that situation a representation. We tend to call the underlying vector space a representation, but it's along with this recipe of how the group is acting on this vector space. All right. And this is what we're going to study today. Oh, did I hear a question popping up? No. All right. Okay. So, well, one nice thing that you can do again with, uh, vector spaces that you couldn't necessarily do with sets is we can take a different basis. So I'm going to take this basis, E1 plus E2 and E1 minus E2. I'm going to veer away from the standard basis and say, why would I want to do that? What'll happen? Well, let's um, work with this other basis and let's in this basis figure out what one, two is doing. Okay. So again, linear algebra, you have two avenues to take. One is you can say, well, let's do the change of basis matrix from the standard basis to this and let's conjugate. That's kind of complicated. I'd rather just compute directly what one to the swap is doing to this basis. Well, if you swap E1 and plus, if you swap E1 and E2, E1 plus E2 becomes E2 plus E1. It's just the same thing. Whereas if here, if you swap E1 and E2, you'll get E2 minus E1, you negate that. And so one thing that's nice about this basis is it diagonalized our previous matrix. And that's really nice. In other words, another way of saying that is this is a basis of eigenvectors. Yeah, and if we draw them, you know, here's E1 plus E2 here, nice, and turns out perpendicular to it, E1 minus E2. You could argue that's a much nicer basis for this representation than the standard one. We love the standard one. We get permutation matrices, but understanding eigenvalues and eigenvectors has a lot of merit in linear algebra. Okay, also diagonal matrices are really wonderful. Yeah. So why do you want to diagonalize a matrix? Well, diagonal matrices, they're easier to work with. You can read off their eigenvalues right away. You can read off their eigenvectors right away. And if you have a couple different diagonal matrices, you know they commute with each other. So diagonalizing is a great thing to do. All right, let's try to repeat this for S3. S3 acts on one, two, three. Let's replace one, two, three with a three-dimensional vector space, C3. Uh, you might say, why do I want to work with the complexes versus the reals versus the rationals? For the symmetric group, it doesn't really matter as long as we're in characteristic zero. But just to be safe, complexes are algebraically closed. We'll work with that because what? We're talking about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. If you want to be able to find your eigenvalues, let's be safe and work with the complexes. All right. Well, if we work at the standard basis and you say what happens with a permutation, again, you'll get a permutation matrix. Yeah? So they'll be mostly zeros, a unique one in each row in each column. Yeah. Permutation matrices are lovely, but what's going on with eigenvalues um, and eigenvectors, is this the best basis to take? I'm gonna take a slightly different basis. 
Uh, this one here, E1 plus E2 plus E3, E1 minus E2, and then E1 plus E2 minus 2 E3. And the first thing that I want to notice about this basis is, let's just look at this first basis vector, E1 plus E2 plus E3. If you act by any permutation, you know, three, you know, send one, two, three to three, two, one, E1 plus E2 plus E3, it might become E3 plus E2 plus E1. Hey, it's always going to give you the same thing back. No matter what you do, you know, the vector, this corresponds in the standard basis to the vector one, 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 it's fixed. It's an eigenvector for every single permutation. So this three-dimensional space, by changing basis, we already realize that it breaks down into this invariant line. Okay, and then there's like an orthogonal complementary plane. And so in terms of representation theory, I would say that this three-dimensional space can be made simpler we should separate out this line, which always stays invariant from this complementary plane. And so we should break this three-dimensional space into a two-dimensional and a one-dimensional. And again, on the level of sets, you know, may maybe see that, right? You've got the set one, two, three. How can you divide up the set one, two, three to make it an easier action? You really can't. But after you linearize, you realize this three-dimensional space very naturally decomposes into a one-dimensional. And a two-dimensional. So that's another reason to linearize things break apart in unexpected ways that you might not have seen before. Okay. All right. Well, I've just made a plug for why linearizing uh, reveals some hidden structures. So let's not just linearize our vector space. Let's try to linearize our group. What would it mean to linearize the symmetric group? You go to what we call the group algebra. And so what is this? Uh, you know, it's a cross between a group and a vector space. So its elements are linear combinations of permutations, and you're, but you're still allowed to multiply them using the distributive law, but now you can add them too, and they have these coefficients. So why does that make sense? Well, you know, this rule of finding a representation, we attach a matrix to every element. Well, you're allowed to scale matrices. I can multiply this matrix by negative three. I can add together two such matrices. I still get a matrix. So on the matrix side of thing, it's totally natural to put coefficients on and add. So that's basically what we're doing. So on the left-hand side, we're like, ah, you know, uh, we can do the equivalent of what we get to do to matrices. All right, so now, now that we have, we can like add and have scalars, we have some new elements in here that we didn't have before. I can take linear combinations of my permutations. And I'm gonna take some very special linear combinations of my permutations. I'm gonna take these things called Juices Murphy elements. And so what are they? If I'm in S3, I've got three Juices Murphy elements the first, the second, and third. The first one is just zero. It's there kind of as a placeholder, but I need it there. The second is just my handy transposition one, two. The third is a linear combination of transpositions, swap one, three, and add it to swap two, three. Okay. What's the pattern? Um, what, where, I want, I'll hopefully tell you later where these elements come from or you know why they were invented. But you know, what's the pattern going on here? If I go into S4 or S5, right? So the fourth Juices Murphy element, you would take the sum of transpositions one, four plus two, four plus three, four. Having done that, maybe we see what would the fifth Juices Murphy element be? Do you see the pattern? I have a guess. Is it the sum all right. of all the transpositions containing five? Uh, the sum of all the transpositions containing five, exactly. One, five, plus two, five, plus three, five, plus four, five. And we won't put five, five, which is the identity. I guess we could if we wanted, but we don't. Okay. And then we see the pattern. Excellent. Now, one thing that uh, um, is, I'm going to give you the punchline now, which is one punchline is, uh, these all commute with each other, which should maybe be surprising to you because like, 
we know that one, two doesn't commute with one, three. Multiply them in one order, you get a three cycle. Multiply them in the other order, you get the inverse of that three cycle. One to two to three versus one to three to two. And yet somehow the transposition one, two actually does commute with the sum, of these other two transpositions. But it turns out, you know, JM3 commutes with JM5. Hmm. It's kind of a big calculation to do. You don't actually do that by calculating. You, you do some clever tricks to see why, why they should commute with each other. Um, happy to talk about that later. We won't have time today, but it's a really fun exercise. Um, you know, the slickest proof that you can that these guys commute. So they commute with each other. Um, the other interesting thing that happens is I can find, if you give me a vector space that SN acts upon, and then I say, well, let me just look at how these Juicis Murphy elements act on it. I can always find a basis that makes them all diagonal. All right, let's check. Um, well, we actually already did that for S2. Right, we found our basis that diagonalize one, two, and zero is always diagonal. So let's check on S3 that we can do this. My other basis I'm going to take, uh, I already, uh, we looked at what the other basis should be above. We talked about why this is good. Well, let's see what the Juices Murphy elements do on this basis. I claim if you calculate it, zero will act to zero, the transition one, two will become this diagonal matrix. Right, and this one minus one is the same as we had before, because as far as one, two is concerned, this and this is our previous basis. And if you calculate what the third Jesus Murphy operator does, you'll get a diagonal matrix, unless I made an error, which is possible. Diagonal matrix with entries two, one minus one. So I didn't write the zeros. Okay. Um, all right, so now let's bring in some vocabulary. So instead of saying eigenvalue eigenbasis, when we have many operators acting and we have simultaneous eigenvalues, we organize them all into what we'll call a weight. So these eigenvectors, or eigenbasis, I'm going to call them a weight basis or weight vectors. And I'm going to call the information about how each of these three operators act, I'm going to call that a weight. So let's check. So if I have E1 plus E2 plus E3, The first operator acts as zero on it, the second operator acts as one on it, and the third operator acts as two on it, right? Why do you get two? This fixes it and this fixes it, but there's a sum, so you get two of them out. So this tuple zero, one, two, I'm gonna call the weight of this basis vector. All right, so let's see. Let's try to figure out the weight of E1 minus E2. That means I'm gonna put here, how does JM1 act? Well, it always acts as zero. How does JM2 act on the second basis vector? Oh, it acts as minus one. I can just read it off of here or I can recompute. How does JM3 act on that same basis vector? I can read off this value or I can recompute one. All right. And then we can compute the weight of the third one. I'll let you either call it out or think a little bit before we do the answer. You can just read off this third entry in all the matrices. We'll get zero, one, minus one. Okay, so these are, so in general, I'm claiming that you give me a representation of SN, I can find a nice basis like this such that they all have weights and I can you know, read off the weights, I can diagonalize. And my weights will always be in the S3, it'll be a three tuple and S4, it'll be a four tuple and so on. So yeah, so what do we observe about these weights? I don't know, maybe nothing. Uh, maybe. They should always start with zero. They should always start with zero. Awesome. They will always start with zero, exactly. Well, because of this. All right, any other, any other observations? really bad one except the first one should all of them sum to zero ah no. okay so these 
In fact, with these two, they do sum to zero, whether they would no. for a bigger representation. Also, but one thing is that these are actually the same three numbers in some mm -hmm. different order. Yeah. So some of these get permuted around, not all of them, but also these are three distinct numbers from what you see here. There's kind of an extra solid line here. And remember this made one subspace and this made another subspace. Yeah. And even though I didn't say so, I had drawn this picture where there's this line and then this plane that these guys span, you might think that this plane also breaks up into two lines, each of which are invariant for S3, and they don't. You sort of, this plane, if you have all of S3 acting, not just the juices murphy elements, it's irreducible. You can get from any vector in here to any other vector if I um, extend linearly. And so um, another, another observation is, um, they're all integers, which, you know, they were eigenvalues of matrices. You know, eigenvalues can be crazy things. So, um, right, and I should have actually, I should have said uh, a little digression because I forgot to say. So, right, when we act on a vector space, it's a representation. So a representation is... Sometimes we call it simple. Sometimes we call it irreducible. They're synonyms, basically. If there's no invariant proper subspaces. So when I say no, you know, no, except for zero and the whole thing. Okay. So my so original three to... Huh? Uh, the fact that these are integers is dependent on the fact that the coefficients in the juices more fee elements are integers? That's or... a good question. Um, yes, you no, know, certainly if I rescaled the juices Murphy operator and I put a, you know, if I put a three halves in front of everything in sight, then everything would get scaled by a three halves and it would happen. But even so, it is kind of an interesting uh, sort of miracle that these will act by integer eigenvalues on any representation. Um, <laughs> since we started with a permutation representation, and so we, if you think about starting with permutation matrices, you know, things filled with integers, it's not such a surprise. Yeah. Um, but, but on the other hand, if it's, you know, a non-diagonal matrix that's filled with integers doesn't have to have integer eigenvalues. So, um, it's it's somewhat related to having integer coefficients here, but it's much more of a miracle than that, I would say. I have one more observation that is probably slightly optimistic, but it looks like our eigenbasis or our, our basis um, is should be contained in the next basis up insofar as that makes sense. Um, your first element, you're going to keep have to ha on having to add E4, E5, et cetera. But otherwise, it feels like I'm just, my first non-trivial element only contains one and two. My second one contains one, two, and three. I suspect those two vectors would also be in my basis for uh, S4 acting on C4. Um. Yeah, so let's let's do that. Yeah, so what would you expect? Let me zoom, let me, so you can see the, those bases at once, right? So, you know, E1 plus E2 and E1 minus E2 was my basis, it was S2. And this is my, my good basis for um, S3. And then for S4, right? I think this is sort of realizing this pattern you were seeing. Okay, this has a plus four on it, but these are the same as before. And you can kind of see, I mean, you start seeing the pattern now of uh, what the basis is gonna be that's gonna work to diagonalize. Now I should say, this is very specific to the fact that we started with this permutation representation, that S4 acts on the numbers one, two, three, four. So then we went to C4 and it kind of carried that action with it. Now, 
it's possible to say, oh, S4 acts on some completely different vector space that I obtain in some completely different way, which if you haven't done representation theory, you might not have any guess for how to do that. In which case, you know, what is that basis? There's going to be some basis that will diagonalize the Jesus Murphy operators and it will give integer eigenvalues, integer values on the diagonal. But what that basis is going to look like and is there a pattern? Um, there is a way to write that basis, but like relative to what reference frame, um, it's it's not quite such, such a nice pattern. But there there is a way to do it. Um, but but the even understanding, so this sequence of vector spaces, sequence of actions, it comes in this nice tower, this nice sequence, in the same way S2 sits in S3, sits in S4, and so on. Um, there is a way to do that in general, uh, but it's trickier. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, so that's another thing, right? If you, you make some observations and then you're like, let's do another example to see if there's more structure and more things we can realize. Um, so ah, the other another observation is um, so these weights are distinct, right? So even though these numbers are the same as these numbers, when they're ordered, they're distinct as a three tuple. Yeah? So that distinctness is really good. Both seeing integers and seeing this kind of distinct behavior tells you there's some really good combinatorics, which given it's a symmetric group, you should have guessed combinatorics. But yeah, there's going to be some really good combinatorics. Uh, All right. Yeah. So, so you said this forms an irreducible space. So, if the okay, if up to ordering the weights are the same, then is it irreducible? Um, like, yeah. So, what ends up happening exactly? So, if you um, if you give me some representation of the symmetric group, and then you say, okay, let my juices Murphy operators act and diagonalize them, which you know you can do. And then if you separate it out by, uh, you know, these, these weights, if, if you see a weight that has just completely different numbers than this, mm -hmm. that's gonna be some sub-representation. Yeah, this is gonna be some sub-representation. They're gonna go together and you're, they're, these are gonna definitely be different. So you're gonna decompose. So what that tells so you is that if, yeah, so no, if so, you yeah. had an irreducible, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just asking like an if and only if. I'll, I'll say, oh yeah. So certainly okay. if it's irreducible, then the weights you see will all be permutations of each other. Yeah, so this whole thing couldn't be irreducible because zero, one, two is not a permutation of here. So that tells you this breaks up into two pieces. Now, the way, so could it ever fail? Well, what if you had this representation twice? You could say, let me take this vector space and let me just take the direct sum of this representation with itself two times. Then you would see double this, right? You'd see this weight vector and a copy of it. Mm -hmm. And so you'd have this weight with multiplicity, you'd see this weight with multiplicity. But that's the only way that you can have duplication. So if, Okay. You take your basis, you look at all of your weights, and you just group together all the weights that are permutations of each other. If that either that's going to be irreducible, or if not, it'll be like five copies of the same representation. So you'd see five copies of this weight and five copies of that weight. Cool. I see. Mm -hmm. So it's really powerful. It's really yeah. powerful. And I haven't explained to you at all why that's true how combinatorics helps us see that, but it does. Right, all right. Yeah, so if n equals four, we get a little more data. And actually, when I made this slide, I just cut and pasted from the other. So you can see like my matrices kind of want to be three by three. And I was like, oh yeah, I just added on the extra because as was observed, this basis is pretty similar to the previous basis and I tacked on this extra basis vector. And so we, you know, so, and what we tack on, you know, we tack on, we get a zero, one, and a two, and then we have to recompute basically how our new Juices Murphy operator is acting. Okay. So let's read off the weights from here. So again, to read off the weights, meaning how does, 
JM1, JM2, JM3, and JM4 act, eigenvalue, 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 eigenvalue. That's just saying you just have to read off the one, one entry in all of them, right? So here we'll have uh, zero minus one, one, two, let's see, zero, one minus one, two, and zero, one, two, minus one. And in blue, I put sort of our new guy. And, uh, you know, there's a whole slew of new observations we can make with this data. Okay, but similar to before, the zero, one, two, three kind of stands on its own and gets separated out. That means I've got a sub representation here, and we've got a sub representation here. And yes, these are all permutations of each other. You don't see every single permutation, you only see certain ways of permuting these. You can make all kinds of conjectures about that. Um, my guess is what you conjecture would be right, and we'll kind of see what's happening with that in a bit. Um, but again, you know, there's this progression, S3 inside S4 inside S5. This way of going, going between is going to give us a lot of mileage in that, you know, we see, you know, this appeared before. We saw this 0, 1, minus 1, 0, minus 1, 1 appearing on the previous page. We also saw like a 0, 1, 2 ap appearing on the previous page. And so if you start analyzing the weights that you see and you know what's happening as you pass between s3 and s4 um and start organizing that data something magical is going to happen all right so let's and here's where um got a little less prepared but let's organize it as follow so in this special representation i saw these four weights and my extra layer of organization is in the plane, I'm gonna make this little bounding box and I'm gonna label my diagonals. I'm gonna make the main diagonal zero diagonal, a one diagonal, a two diagonal, three diagonal in this direction, a minus one diagonal, a minus two. So I'm just gonna write this quadrant. I'm gonna populate it with all integers. And then I am going to kind of mark where my weight is on this picture. So like zero, one, two, three are kind of sitting there and I should maybe, you know, maybe try to put the zero, one, two, three in boxes that are as greedy towards going with gravity to the upper left-hand corner. So then what might I do with my zero, zero minus one, one, two being greedy towards here? Oh, here's a zero minus one, one, two. Uh, and then the same thing here, I have a zero, one, minus one, two, and I have a zero, one, two, and a minus one. <laughs> so I claim that if you take a representation of SN, you use these Juices Murphy operators, you diagonalize and you analyze the weights. You can always put them on this grid in this way, and you can make this bounding box, and you're going to see a partition. So you should think back to that young uh, partition that we started with. Hmm. There's more information. Uh, so what I should say, so this fact that these numbers are totally different from these numbers is captured in that this shape is totally different from these shape, but that these three all share the same shape. There's more information. There's the information of, this is how JM1 acted, how, JM2 acted, how JM3 acted, how JM4 acted. In other words, one, two, three, and four are acting in this way. Yeah. So in this shape, yeah, JM1 is acting as zero. Oh yeah, that was the observation, right? Zero always acts as zero. So the zero box is always gonna get a one in it. But then how does JM2 act on this? Oh. Well, JM2 acts as minus one, because so I'm reading in the second entry. So that means that's where I put it to. Right? Whereas in the next picture, the one comes next. 
So my two would go here or my two would go here. Okay, any questions on this process? All right, so now if I wanna put in the threes, right? I'll say, okay, how is JM3 acting? Well, over here, it's acting as one. So I put a three on the one diagonal. Here, I put a three on the minus one diagonal. And here, I'm gonna put a three on the two diagonal. All right, and then I have to figure out where four goes. Four is in what's left over. Okay. And so, all right. So how are we connecting this up to Young's lattice that we saw in the beginning? On the one hand, my weights, when they get organized in this way, a partition pops out. More than a partition popping out, there's an ordering of the boxes, or if you think about it, it's basically following the way in which S3 sits inside of S4, the fact that these both have the zero, one, uh, minus one and zero, minus one, one that we saw before in common, and they both have the two in the same spot. In other words, they both have the four in the same spot. That information is captured in here. And it actually, instead of just being combinatorial information is algebraic information. It's about, you know, I can restrict the action from S4 to S3. And I can say, when I restrict, and now I look at this vector space that maybe was irreducible, that had no invariant spaces, if you have fewer operators, more subspaces have a chance of being invariant. Okay, and so this relationship um, between S3 and S4 and S5 and so on is also being captured. Okay, so now, yeah, right? And, um, whoops, this is a different, let me, um, go back and make it relevant to what we were just doing. So we had a weight like, uh, you know, zero, one, minus one, two, which we said when we uh, captured all those boxes would correspond to what zero, one, whoops, one, two, three, four. But you can also think of it as saying one, I'm capturing this box, one and two are here, one and two and three are here, and then, oops, one and two and three and four are here. And so this picture of the weight, so let's see, so this is a weight. This is something that we call a standard young, tableau, um, a partition, sometimes people call it a young diagram, just like this is Young's lattice of partition. So Young is all over the place. And a standard Young tableau is not just something that statically lives at level four, although it kind of is because it's a weight of this S4 representation. Um, it is a history. It is a history. It is a path that's actually walking from the root down to here. And then if you think, hmm, what are all the different paths that take four steps to get from here to here? They'll actually be in bijection with all of our weights, which will be in bijection with the standard Young tableau. And what is a standard Young tableau? It's not just filling the four boxes with one, two, three, four. You have to fill them in a way so that each time you remove the biggest letter, what you have left also looks like a partition with my gravity being this way, right? Like you won't have one box and two box there. You can't move, remove the two, you know, you, you can't go removing stuff too soon. I can't like remove the one box and I get a big hole in space. And so uh, another way to recognize the standard Young tableau is that the numbers always have to increase across each row and they also have increase down each column. And as long as that's satisfied, exactly correspond to some path along here. So the upshot is 
that let's see let me do yeah so this one for this slide i had chosen a sort of a different um a different shape and different pads and different fillings so so what's what's the upshot here if i want to understand the irreducible representations of say you know s4 here's a picture of all of them there's five of them okay and um Part of how one could have redrawn this lattice and understood that and rediscovered this was using these commuting operators, these Justus Murphy operators. And what happens is each one of these comes with the basis that diagonalizes the Justus Murphy operators, the weight basis, and the weights can be read off and they correspond um, by labeling the diagonals. Each basis element corresponds to a different path here. In other words, a different standard filling here. Okay. Then you can do one, then, you know, combinatorics, you can just say, well, look, here's this combinatorial graph. How do I count all of the paths from here to here? Is there a nice closed formula? Yes, there is. It's called the hook link formula. Um, again, there's lots of other ways you can play with this lattice and they can give you all kinds of different information. Uh, and I should say, we said combinatorially what the edges meant. You just stick one diagram in the other. Representation theoretically, what the edges mean now is, oh, restrict this vector space from S4 to S3, which represent irreducible representations of S3 do I see? So if I took the one we were just talking about, restrict from S4 to S3, it breaks up into these two pieces, which we see from the weights. We see that if we, um, I don't wanna say it, if you're always ignoring, ignoring the fourth Juices Murphy operator, you'll see, you know, a zero, one, two, and a zero, one, minus one, and a zero, minus one, one, that suddenly um, what's the same and what's different if you drop an operator, things split up into two different kind of orbits. So, gosh, I went a lot slower than um, I intended to, to tell you some of the generalizations. So let me just, um, let me just say a few things here. So everything I said today is kind of known and classical. All right. And so what are some things that are unknown? Well, everything I did, I said I worked over the complex numbers. And it would have been actually fine over the reals um, or the rationals. But if you were to work over, you know, FP in characteristic P, then a lot of stuff goes wrong and a lot of stuff sort of isn't known and a lot of the things that we want to do don't work in, in for instance even if we look at s2 acting on uh oh now it would be you know f2 plus f2 with again a standard basis e1 e2 try to diagonalize the transposition one two uh, you actually can't if you were to take, um, a, you know, you can't do E1 plus E2 and E1 minus E2. You could do E1 plus E2 and E1. And then one, two will go to this matrix was like a Jordan block. Like it can't be diagonalized. So a lot of things break. And there's a lot of open unknown questions here. There is some stuff that's known. There's some combinatorics. There's kind of an analog of Young's lattice that you can draw that gives you much less information. So the graph is there, but what it tells you about the representation, it tells you much less. So that's kind of interesting. Um, another way, uh, other directions that you can generalize in where stuff is known, instead of the symmetric group, you go to what's called a Hecke algebra, which basically differs, you know, if we draw one, two, as kind of swapping one and two, you could say, well, what if uh, I really think about having an overcrossing or an undercrossing so that if you do one, two twice, you know, that's just the same as uncrossing them. Whereas if you do this one twice, uh-oh, you get something super tangled up and twisty um, or heck algebra, or I should say at the moment, it just looks like a braid and a braid group. So you can um, study these other generalizations where maybe this is related to the, un 
to the identity, maybe it's not. So you can study the representation theory of that. Also, when you draw these pictures, right, we tend to draw them uh, just kind of like on a rectangle, but you could say, well, what if they lived on an annulus? What if I had two points here and two points here, and they get to do things like wrap around the annulus, right? You get something called an affine or an annular Hecke algebra. You can study its representation theory. And then you could even say, look, in these pictures, instead of everything always going down, 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 what if they get to turn around? What if they get to do crazy things like this? Yeah. And you could say, wow, I could draw something that composes in the way I compose permutations by just stacking on top of each other. You can get these diagrammatic algebras. And uh, one kind of miracle that happens is that you can build representations of all of these algebras that I was mentioning here. Um, you can't get all the representations, but you can get a good number of representations that have an analog of Juice's Murphy operators acting diagonalizably, where a basis corresponds to now not just directed paths going here, you can have paths where you can kind of, you get to go up and down, or you get to go like zigzaggy. And so um, all of the theory you build up for the symmetric group applies into these new areas if you know how to look at it in the right way. Um, and then for the annular ones, instead of always starting at the top, you could say, well, let me, all, let me always start from here. And then you can still make a theory and still have a basis that corresponds to certain walks in here that have certain properties. And a lot of the reason why it works is the same reason it works for the symmetric group. So, oh, since I'm over time, I had better stop. Let's thank our speaker. Are there any questions? I had one question that came up, you know, early on in some of the motivation mm -hmm. for uh, young lattice, Young's lattice. Um, so we put a relation between two partitions if we can fit one inside the other. Mm -hmm. But if we don't, but often we can fit like lots, it, it, one inside the other in a lot of different ways. So I was wondering if that, you could create like a weighted relation between two partitions. I was wondering if that ended up showing up in representation theory, or I guess you could even create a partition of all of the different part of all the different ways you could place a partition inside another partition. And so, like the I covering so relations, so you want to maybe jump down a level, like you want to right. stick this one in here, in here, or in here. Right. Hmm. Let me think. And other people in the audience who might know faster than I do can say. Um, Um, so one, uh, so I don't think I've looked at that. One thing you can do is there's also, um, this picture, it also comes up in, um, symmetric functions or symmetric polynomials. Mm -hmm. Um, you might know there's something called like the Frobenius characteristic map that, um, the irreducible representations or irreducible characters of the symmetric group will correspond to sure functions. Whereas like bump functions on the mm -hmm. conjugate classes will correspond to the power sum symmetric functions. Um, so in there, you might know about um, like the Pieri rule or a Littlewood Richardson rule. Okay. And um, if, you know, that sometimes has to do with, okay, you know, very often you might think about sticking this partition always in the upper left hand corner, but I think you can kind of make sense of a partition sitting in, inside here in a slightly different way. Okay. Um, using using symmetric functions, but um, uh, which you know you would sort of see, you could sort of say, well, if I'm going between here and here, you say, okay, I have symmetric functions on 
you know, four variables, you know, x1, x2, x3, x4, or sorry, on, um, I'm sorry, on one alphabet. And this would be like, oh, sort of put in, put in two alphabets in a way that, you know, you capture this. Um, but I'm not, um, yeah, I'm not really sure. I, I haven't really thought about sticking it in, you know, somewhere else other than having, you know, other than aligning here. So yeah, I haven't right. done that much with it. Okay. Well, thank you. So I have a question. Unfortunately, my computer just froze. So I hope you can hear me on my phone. I can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Um, my my question is, where do these choices Murphy elements come from? So are they yeah. here also product groups? Um, what was the second part about where they come from and then what? Uh, if they also show up in other groups, if I look at oh. representation theory of other groups, not the symmetric group. Yeah, they come up in other algebras that are related to the symmetric group. And for other Coxeter groups, the ones that come in families, I think there might be some analogs. Maybe, maybe Steve Doby possibly has worked on um, on such things. I would look, um, but yeah. So for me, where the juices Murphy elements um, come from uh, is that. So, you know, I mentioned for, well, I'm gonna make it a heck algebra versus a symmetric group, right? You can say, okay, it's uh, if we live on an annulus, right? Instead of um, just crossing here, so things can wrap around. Um, to me, this is, this would be the land of affine heck algebras. And, um, uh, wait, I drew a picture for myself so I get the orientation roughly right. Um, here. So if you, um, let's just check. So if you wrap around, it's so okay. To draw something that wraps around the cylinder, well, because I'm really terrible at drawing, it's pretty bad. So like if I wrap around and then I, you know, come back and then I come here and then say I have another strand. So the juices Murphy elements um, correspond to something that um, wraps. So instead of drawing it like this, it's just easier to say I've identified the edges. Yeah, and then I don't have to draw a cylinder. And so for the juices Murphy elements, what you can actually do, if you think about something wrapping around the cylinder, back. Yeah, these things are very, uh, are very natural. And then what I what I do here is, um, okay, sorry. This would, um, okay, sorry. So if I draw it here, and I think of it wrapping around the cylinder, but then I say, well, the juices Murphy element is just living like in the symmetric group or in the Hecke algebra where I don't have a cylinder. So if you fill in the cylinder, instead of coming around behind, it just looks like it comes here and then comes back, right? There's sort of a some people would draw like a little pole here that wraps around, that's the filling of the cylinder. But once you fill it in, it just wraps around. And if you didn't have over versus under crossings, you would just say, this is the identity, right? I just pull it tight, it's the identity. When you have over versus under crossings and you have a rule for how over and under crossings relate, which I didn't say, it turns out that this is gonna reproduce Juice's Murphy elements for you, okay? And then, uh, if you are, um, 
and then you can also right so in the same way you know we only think about one two one three plus one plus two three one three one four plus two four plus three four if you don't you know you're not touching five six seven so this juices murphy element lives in you know with four land five land six land by just oh only cross so many um coming around your cylinder and yeah so for me this is where they come from so these are very natural elements to look at it's kind of clear they commute with each other they're sort of an analog of a polynomial algebra that would naturally live on the cylinder so they come from they actually come from uh, an affine land a land where there's just more structure and then you smash things down and you look at their shadows and you're like oh these things that are natural to look at upstairs that wind around that all commute with each other when I fill in the cylinder and I say what they are downstairs, Juices Murphy operators, they just pop out that formula. And then so you say, oh, it's obvious they commute with each other. Kind of upstairs, you knew what the spectrum looked like. So that becomes the spectrum downstairs. But they, to me, they live in the upstairs picture. So I'd say, yeah. So for me, um, these diagrammatic ways of drawing these algebras is really, um, is for me where they come from. Now, historically, I, I have to actually, I've never looked at the original papers. I, I've read some other, some papers by Murphy, but like where they actually first appeared on the scene, I don't think that they were motivated from this picture. That's just how I think of them. So I don't actually know historically how and why they necessarily came up with them. Okay, that's uh, perfectly that fine. Out. Thank you. Are there more questions? Um, um, I just can I just ask? Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so, <clears throat> so these are the Cherednik Dunkel operators, right? What you were talking about in this yeah. uh, picture. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, is this just like t equal to one specialization gives me Joseph Murphy or like? Ah, uh, uh, so. Um, Right, so I'm 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 actually like for this I'm not in the double affine heck algebra. I, you know I'm in the half affine heck algebra. But yeah, it would be it would be sort of these yi's, and um, it would be um, uh, yeah you would you would um, you would basically be having your parameters being generic. Um, and then, so, so the, again, uh, the representation, I don't want to say, um, you know, this lives in an even bigger world, I would say it lives in kind of a double affine world, like living on a torus. Yeah. Um, but they do, um, if you have a quotient from an affine Hecke algebra to a Hecke algebra, that sense. So if you call, so these Cherednik Dunkel operators, let's say you call them like Y1 and Y2 and so on, which many people do. Yeah. If you just send this to a constant like one, the relations that you have for how these operators build up, this will go to sort of T1 squared, which is to put it in, to draw these pictures, right? That would be like this double twist. And this because, um, so, right, so if you look at this picture where you would only have two strands, it would look like a double twist. Whereas if you had more strands, you have to have that double twist and extend it this way and this way. And so it's the double twist and this basically pulls, sorry, this pulls this strand this way and pulls this strand this way so that it crosses two strands. And so if it's crossing three strands, you would have, whoops, and so on. And if you actually want to get the Juices Murphy elements, you want to do something like, depending on what your quadratic relation is, you might have like yk minus q to the k over q minus one. That will go to a sum of, you know, q to the something, depending on the length, you know, it'll be t sub w's where the w's will come from the set, you know, uh, 1k, 2k, 3k, and so on. So it'll be, um, 
you'll get a Q version of a Juices Murphy, but you have to do this kind of, um, what I want to say, this kind of, it's almost like differentiating that you would take like a limit as Q goes to one and get your Juices Murphy operator. So if you think about in calculus, right, you do, you know, F of X minus over f of x minus f of one over x minus one, the limit as x goes to one is like a derivative um, or it's like a log and, and that's how you're technically creating. So I, I went into some technical detail there because I figure if you know Tredenic Dunkel operators, you kind of can parse what's happening in this yeah. picture. In this so language. is there a good reference for this, uh, this connection? Um, a good reference for this this home yeah. this uh, map here. Yeah. Um. Oh, it's many places. Um. Uh. Probably work of Arun Ram. Would I guess would talk about it? He has some papers like building up the combinatorics for representations of affine Hecke algebras. Um. You know, my thesis had some stuff on this. Um, and I have a paper with, with Ian Granofsky um, and with another good reference. Ugh, I'm not, you know, I, I learn stuff from various places and I don't always know the best references. I'd have to maybe think about that possibly. Right, you, okay. you. Uh, where, where, you know, what are the good exposit? I mean, the, the ones that have good exposition, I don't know off the top of my head. And okay, so I think it's question. time to thank our speaker again, and then maybe there's some time for inofficial questions after we have stopped yeah. the recording. So Monica, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. And then, oops, I think Sheila left. I think she had had a question before. Oh, well, I'll have to email her. <laughs>